on some uh, example systems, okay, that, that, that are old than you, okay. Um, and then finally, I'll cover some of the, uh, the aspects of running our winter school and some of the details about that. Um, okay, so here we go. So just to start out, um, when I was young, I learned uh, condensed matter physics from some very fine uh, professors. And the, uh, one of the key aspects of condensed matter physics we learned was the idea of broken symmetry. And essentially that was the uh, textbook definition of phases of matter that I grew up with and learned and started to do research on uh, for many years. And we all know broken phases of matter as different types of symmetries that are broken, for instance, just crystal symmetries, rotational symmetries, et cetera, et cetera, superconductors and so on. So, you know, almost every phase of matter you can think of breaks some kind of symmetry and that's how we think about it. Um, of course, in, in, okay, so superconductivity is one of the most famous ones. It has a subtle symmetry breaking, but nevertheless, it's a, a phase of matter, it's a phase transition, and uh, this has kept us busy for 100 plus years. Um, and of course, it's ubiquitous. It's all over the peri periodic table. So even if you just think about elements, they're quite interesting. And uh, some, even some of these elemental superconductors are quite exotic in some sense in some cases. Um, now go uh, fast forward 90 years or so since the discovery of superconductivity and um, we came across some more interesting phases of matter which don't necessarily fit the mold of this broken symmetry aspect. And uh, in particular the quantum Hall effect and the idea of topology which has really been uh, uh, elucidated in the last 10 years and in particular, these three fine gentlemen here that won the Nobel Prize talking about this type of physics um, uh, really explained to us that some phases of matter and some aspects of condensed matter physics have to be thought about in a different way. And, um, you know, the, the, uh, everyone's seen the coffee cup and donut uh, analogy of, of, um, of uh, topology and condensed matter physics. And I always use this slide just to explain how, you know, the genus is what's the key parameter in geometry, whether how many holes you have in, in your object. And you can apply this theorem in the same way to the electronic structure. It's a more subtle thing, but essentially how many twists you have in the band structure gives you this so-called churn number and so on and so on gives you some interesting non-trivial topology to your electronic system. And the canonical topological insulator that arose in this fashion was bismuth selenide, which uh, we worked on several years ago. We continue to work on it. And um, the, the, the very general idea is just that you have some atoms that you put together, bismuth and selenium. And when you put them in a, in a solid, they form uh, a lattice, of course. And the atomic orbitals essentially go from being isolated to bonding. And so you get some splitting of energy levels, as we all know. And in some cases, such as this case here, basically the, uh, some of the energy levels get pushed down and some get pushed up and they may cross. And in this particular case, you have these energy levels of the P orbitals, uh, bonding orbitals that cross and give you this, this twist, this non-trivial topology. And so this you know, adds a whole new dimension to uh, research in condensed matter physics that basically wasn't captured in any textbook uh, that was used over 10 years ago. And so how do we deal with this? Well, um, the term quantum materials, I don't know exactly when it was coined or who is responsible for it, but uh, we do know what, it, um, what purpose it serves and that's, that's to capture this new physics and other things as well. But uh, there, there's a number of general topics which uh, don't necessarily fall under broken symmetry phases of matter. And now we, we talk about them as quantum materials. Of course, in some sense, quantum is anything is quantum. Uh, a penny is quantum, right? <laughs> but uh, it's more specific than that. And it talks about particular classes of materials or systems that, uh, that we're interested in. And here's, you know, three, for example. Um, you can 
elaborate on these things, of course, and there's many, many things you can add to these lists. Um, and uh, including, of course, broken symmetry phases of matter uh, that are, you know, can overlap with these other things such as topology and quantum liquids and so on. So it's a very rich uh, field of work of, of um, condensed matter physics. So um, one of the interesting things over the last several years that has, that has rose out of this kind of research is the idea of very exotic quasi particles. So go, again, going beyond what uh, many of us learned in the early days um, about how to think about electrons and materials and other th related things, uh, pairing up as Cooper pairs and so on. Now we have relativity playing a role, giving us Dirac, Vial, uh, more exotic fractional quasi particles, Majoranas, anions, skirmions, et cetera, et cetera. So quantum materials is, again, as I said, a nice catch all for all of this stuff. But of course, there's much interplay between all these different aspects of this research. Um, in terms of the field of research, uh, one of the amazing things that's happened in, in the last uh, less than 10 years is uh, financial support for this kind of research. And not to say that condensed matter physics hasn't been uh, financed, but uh, this particular uh, subfield quantum materials in particular material synthesis, which I'll talk more about, um, has really been uh, um, supported by some key things that have happened. In particular, the Moore Foundation stepped in about uh, seven, eight, seven years ago with the EPICS program and really injected uh, some much needed funding for this kind of research, really focusing on um, material synthesis and related research. So that's a, that was a, a really nice thing and I'm happy to be part of that program, of course. Uh, more more other things in, in other fields. DOE is also, um, and, and NSF has has uh, become involved in quantum, not specifically quantum materials, but quantum computing related or quantum information related uh, funding avenues. And quantum materials falls into that bracket in some way. And I think that's still, uh, it's still being understood how that's gonna play out. So that's an exciting, a research. Uh, let me go back to that. Uh, this is the one and only time I'll ever show a picture of some of the people in, in this slide, but uh, is the one nice uh, thing I think that came out of this administration, in my opinion anyways, um, which was this National Quantum Initiative. There was a bill signed uh, to, in principle, fund uh, quantum technology and quantum research for many years. And I think that's still playing out, of course, how that's going to roll out. And it's not necessarily just to build a quantum computer. It's going to be funding many different fields of, of science and physics in particular. And some part of that, the hope is, will be quantum materials and we'll get some more uh, support for basic, basic exploratory and fundamental research to develop new materials and new systems for um, for quantum information or quantum technologies in general. Um, and then just a flash, uh, this is a bit dated now, it's about a year or so old, but just to pick some numbers from Web of Science uh, in these topics of quantum materials, so if you just search on these terms, you can see the number of publications in the last 10 years. Um, have really, you know, really been quite a few and uh, superconductors of course is an old topic, but some new, new, uh, relatively new discoveries came along. And you can see how some things have just grown, topological materials, Majoranas, spin liquids, and so on. Okay, so in citations included. So it's a growing field, and of course, it's gonna to continue to grow as we find new things. Okay, so, uh, so back home here uh, in Maryland, we have this uh, thing called the Quantum Materials Center, which is uh, been renamed from what it was originally called, which is the Center for Superconductivity Research. Uh, it's had a few, few different names, but now our, the focus really is on quantum materials. And we're lucky to have some uh, local funding to, to run a center like this and to have a collection of, of expertise, of facilities, and focus to, to explore this area of research. So just to advertise what we're doing here, we have, you know, a, dozen or so faculty in physics that are condensed matter physicists that are involved 
and then many more actually affiliate faculty in, in different departments in different colleges, even engineering, uh, chemistry, and so on that are, that are doing multidisciplinary research with us. And then, uh, you know, a lot following along with that, there's many postdocs and research scientists and so on that work in this center. Um, it's a bricks and mortar center, so we actually have many facilities to carry out research, and that's one of the key aspects of our, our center, that people actually uh, book time on instruments, uh, shown in various uh, pictures here, and they can do all kinds of different experiments, uh, crystal growth, material synthesis, then film growth, and so on. And the, one of the key things is that people are working in the same lab um, from different groups, different PIs, working on similar projects or even the same project, collaborating, bumping into each other. And this is one of the uh, key things of having a center where people interact. Of course, these days with COVID, uh, we don't interact nearly as much, but it's slowly coming back. And um, just to say that, you know, having a center like this is, we're lucky to have this where people can interact on a daily basis. But uh, this is also the way I view some of the programs in ICAM, in particular Quantum X, where you can actually exchange and collaborate with people that are not necessarily in the same city um, in, in a more meaningful way. And I'll give you one example of that. Okay, uh, whoops. So here's, uh, you know, one of the bread and butter things we do in the center is actually grow materials, synth synthesize, uh, both crystals and thin films. And here's just a snapshot of some of the capabilities we have, uh, in particular various techniques that are used to grow materials. Uh, and, you know, depending on the material you're growing, you, you would use one of these particular techniques for one reason or another, either high temperatures, low temperatures, volatility, um, vapor pressure, you name it. There's different reasons you would use a different technique to grow something. And, uh, you know, the fact that we have these facilities uh, in various instrumentation to both uh, synthesize and do basic measurements allows us to have uh, the ability to train people. And this is really one of the key things. So, of course, students, undergrads, graduates, postdocs come to the center to, to learn these techniques and use the facilities. But uh, as here, as mentioned, we've for the last four years or so, we've tried to run this uh, uh, Fundamentals of Quantum Materials Winter School to bring people in and actually use these instrumentation, these facilities to, to learn hands-on. And I'll talk a bit more about that. So before we get there, um, um, I'll just review some of the research that's come out of our center and it, it just touches on some different topics in quantum materials research. Uh, so, of course, superconductivity is, um, uh, it, that's, that's our history, history, that's the reason our center was formed uh, about 30 years ago. Um, so we've had many different uh, projects working in superconductivity from cuprates and on, iron-based superconductors in the last 10 years and so on, and more recently, topological materials, which I'll mention as well. Um, of course, one of my favorites is the iron-based superconductor family, which uh, is not in the news that much these days, but people are still working on it. It's still interesting. Um, one of the interesting things for us, at least, is that iron, the element iron, plays a key role. You know, if you replace iron with another element, another transition metal, you do not get 50 Kelvin superconductivity. And that's one of the uh, thrusts we've been still, we are still exploring, trying to understand why what is so special about iron? And there's various ideas on that, of course, but there's no uh, uh, there's no consensus on exactly why, and and therefore understanding exactly how it works. Um, so uh, one of the nice things about the iron superconductor family, uh, and that's one of the reasons we jumped into it early on, was it, was that it's so versatile chemically speaking. So. I've highlighted all the different elements. This is probably, of course, outdated now, but uh, all the different elements involved in the iron superconductors where you necessarily have to actually substitute elements in to actually induce superconductivity in most cases. And uh, it ranges from alkali metals, alkali earths, transition metals, nictogens, 
calcogens, uh, fluorine, and so on, rare, it's, so it spans everything. And that's a nice toolbox to use as a, as a quantum material scientist, because you can go in and tweak things and do systematic studies, which we've done over many years. Um, and of course, uh, you know, the generic features of the iron superconductors, in particular the phase diagram, canonical phase diagram of magnetism and superconductivity has driven much research. Uh, and I just like showing this because this is a nice example of where uh, alkali, um, alkali metal substitution, transition metal substitution, and nictogen substitution all give you the same phase diagram. So we're doing something right, right? <laughs> There's something universal here and, and it's not quite understood exactly why. There, I mean, we have a pretty good consensus on why, but uh, again, the chemical toolbox you can use to, to tune things and, and look at the physics here is quite amazing. Okay, let's skip over that. In more recent times, there's been some uh, uh, more interest in, in using other techniques to search for superconductivity. Um, one thing we've been dabbling with in the last few years is to try to use machine learning or AI to try to predict superconductors. Uh, we're lucky to have a database, the NIMS database of superconduct superconductors, all known superconductors, or most, which has something like 20,000 compounds in it. And so we played a game where we could uh, take that database, which is still relatively small compared to, for instance, Google Photos, which has gazillions of photos. And that's why, you know, you, uh, Google can machine learn the human face and create, you know, fake people. <laughs> but uh, we don't have gazillions of superconductors, so it's a bit harder to do a machine learning approach to this. But nevertheless, you can do some things. And um, so this is one project where, again, with some material scientists, chemists, uh, computational people, um, we came up with some list that you know came out of a, uh, building a model of what the machine might think a superconductor should be. And there's a list of compounds here, which we're still playing around with and you know we haven't found one that we've predicted but it's a place to start so you know rather than just looking for a needle in a haystack maybe you're looking for a crochet needle in a haystack okay it's a little bit a little bit of a guide to to search so that's a more modern technique that's taking off uh, in several places topological materials of course has grown uh, uh, tremendously it's not just topological insulators anymore there's many different flavors um, over the last 10 years, we've been involved in various things, uh, bismuth selenide studies, samarium hexaboride, which is known by several people in this crowd, um, and then more recent things. Uh, one of the things that came out uh, in the last uh, year or so was this very nice experiment led by my uh, colleague, Ichiro Takeuchi, uh, but including some theory support at, at Maryland, as well as uh, uh, various experimentalists to bring together uh, films of samarium hexaboride and doing some uh, point contact spectroscopy to show that there's something very unusual, in particular uh, what, we, what we observed as perfect and drive reflection. And we, we uh, attribute it to the, the Klein paradox or the or Klein tunneling into the system. Um, and it involves proximity effect of superconductivity into the SMB6. And we we're quite happy to see this result and uh, and it's very promising for potential technologies. So we're working on that these days. But it has a number of, of, uh, of uh, components that spread across quantum materials research. So superconductivity and film development, uh, topological materials, uh, a, a spectroscopic technique to do the experiment and so on. So this is one of the nice examples of having a collection of expertise that we can bring together fairly rapidly and do this. And it, as I said, it doesn't necessarily have to be in the same uh, complex, the same bricks and mortar house, but uh, uh, through exchanges and so on, you can do this kind of thing. And I think that's very powerful. Um, just to flash some research that's actually not uh, published yet, but we're, we're almost there. Uh, it's quite exciting because we found some, some um, uh, potential topology in, in this compound barium aluminum four. 
you know, those of you that have heard that name before, you probably know that it's a, it's a prototype compound. So there's literally thousands of compounds that derive from this barium aluminum force structure shown here, including the, a uh, lot of the iron superconductors, which have this guy here. And so uh, the fact that this compound itself has some topological aspects in its electronic structure suggests that you can do a lot. You can go forward and try to think of using this structure and this compound even in different ways to exploit a, a non-trivial topology, uh, including things like uh, looking how it, how it interacts with charge order, superconductivity, et cetera. So this is a emerging field that we're working on. Okay, um, this is the one quantum X example I'll, I'll, I'll highlight. Uh, we've been happy to, uh, to use the quantum X program to send, uh, I think I've always sent grad students, uh, even an undergrad at one point, um, to different labs to collaborate with people. And this was one great example where it uh, stemmed from a visit by Peter Avamonte at Maryland just uh, following a discussion about some material and some uh, experimental observations we had that were quite unusual. Uh, we had an idea, so we applied for uh, an exchange. We sent a student to Urbana to work with Peter to do x-ray and lo and behold, there was a discovery made, in, which in particular was uh, this charge, charge order, charge density wave order in this nickel arsenide system. And from there, it just exploded. So and we're still working on it, of course, but basically, uh, it stemmed from another project that we were working on at Maryland uh, to study superconductivity in this system. So in a 30 second summary, I'll just explain that superconductivity in barium nickel arsenic is, is thought to be conventional, just electron phonon mediated. It's below one Kelvin, so it's, uh, it's not high TC by any means. But the interesting thing is that when you tune the system by just replacing barium with strontium, um, the uh, TC of the superconductor actually stays pretty flat until you get to this region where you have this suppression of a um, structural order, but we also uncovered that there's a very strong pneumatic susceptibility divergence following this structural order suppression. So we attributed it to an enhancement of TC due to pneumatic fluctuations. And that was with the help of uh, Rafael Fernandez in theory and we're still working on this. So this is a nice collaboration between x-ray work theory and, uh, and our experiments in, of course, material synthesis at Maryland. And uh, as I said, one of the, the reasons this all came about was through this exchange, just sending a student over to Urbana for a couple months to, uh, to explore this possibility and finding something, luckily. And we continue to work on that. Okay, um, topological superconductors is also a, a very exciting field. So it's bringing these two subfields together in some sense. Um, just to, uh, there, there's a, well, okay, I won't get into that. But the, the, uh, the, there are superconductors that you can couple to topological insulators and call them topological, but there's also intrinsically topological superconductors. These are slightly two different things. Um, we've been exploring both, of course. Uh, this is one example of a uh, uh, quite interesting material, which we, we uh, uh, have been exploring for several years now. And this is this half Heusler material, yttrium platinum bismuth. Turns out it's a very simple band structure. It's just uh, these uh, bismuth, uh, bismuth derived P bands, but because of strong spin orbit coupling, there's a, there's a again, non-trivial topology. There's a twist to this. But then on top of that, because of the high symmetry of the material, the J equals three halves P-like manifold does not get split up. And uh, because the, the Fermi energy tends to lie right near this, uh, this band here, um, and it becomes a superconductor, we get a quite exotic possibility of pairing. And that's what we explored in this work here. And our conclusion from experiments, as well as some theory uh, guidance from Daniel Achterberg and Philip Ryden uh, was that we have pairing of higher spin or higher angle, I should say, angular momentum Cooper pairs in this case. And that's kind of opened up a quite big field of studying this in other materials. Um, and you have, you know, you have many different options of, of course, singlet, triplet, 
and we, we could said beyond triplet, which means quintet, septet, and so on. So that's still an ongoing project. Um, now the more recent uh, discovery at Maryland was the, of this uranium ditelluride, which uh, several of you are, well, there's actually collaborators in the audience here that we're working with on this. Um, it really is attributed to uh, the, our collaboration with Nick Butch at NIST and his then postdoc, Sheng Ran, who discovered the uh, superconductivity uh, about a year and a half ago or so. Um, and it's, it's led to a very flurry of exciting discoveries, which I won't go through in detail, but there's just a, to highlight some interesting things, Vidya is in the audience. She, they found some very interesting chiral aspects of the superconducting state. Um, the fact that uh, you can crank up the field in Tallahassee, actually, sorry, in uh, Los Alamos at the National High Field Lab up to 60 Tesla and still see superconductivity in fact, induced superconductivity in a certain orientation field angle uh, is, is quite amazing. And the list goes on and on. We're studying the, the, the aspects of uh, the superconducting state in this system, which is quite rich and quite exotic and looks like it's topological. Um, so this, you know, this is, involves many, many different collaborations and experiments. Uh, but again, the uh, the baseline is really material synthesis, and we've developed a whole suite of um, furnaces and instruments to be able to grow high quality crystals and do all kinds of studies at Maryland to do this. Uh, okay, so, um, so that's the, some of the topics, uh, areas of research we've worked on, and uh, I flashed some pictures of some of the facilities we have. And one uh, time, it was actually Nick Butch and I, we were sitting having a beer or two, talking about um, the fact that we have these nice facilities and it would be nice to train people and have some kind of school. And we thought up, well, why don't we just try to get some funding and, and ha actually have a school where students come in and actually get hands-on training, not just sit down and listen to lectures, but actually go in the lab and try to get their hands dirty and take something away from that um, beyond what's, what's typically uh, provided in other workshops and schools. And so we went to, first to uh, the Moore Foundation to see if they would be interested in funding this and luckily they were. And so that was our first school and that was in 2017. Um, so we call it the Fundamentals of Quantum Materials Winter School. We've been having it each January um, I'm not sure we're going to have it this January due to obvious reasons, uh, but we'll, maybe we'll skip a year or maybe have it in the summer or something like that. Um, but uh, it's a school where we bring in roughly 30 to 45 junior scientists, which range from undergraduates to postdocs. And uh, even some professors are very keen to participate uh, and go through the practical sessions. Um, and it's about a week, it's a week long school where uh, the students attend lectures and then actually go and uh, learn, uh, uh, participate in different modules. Um, and we're actually coming out with a book uh, that has some chapters that, that, uh, that uh, uh, address different techniques and, and, and sort of practical information and, and tips to go along with this, which is uh, in, the, in the works now. Um, okay, so uh, this is just an example from the last school in January 2020, where we had a list of speakers that came and uh, we covered various topics and there's a slightly different uh, theme each year. Um, and then the practical training is, as you can see for this year, we had these six modules that included uh, flux growth. So several growth techniques of crystal growth, floating zone, arc melting, hydrothermal synthesis, thin film growth, and then some uh, characterization, x-ray diffraction. And these things slightly change every year, depending on um, what we want to focus on. Um, here's a snapshot of one of the, well, this is the first day, which just where we have some morning talks, one hour talks. So Brian Sales gave the first talk, very, very, very nice 
introduction and practical information on flux growth, uh, Weiwei and Stephen Wilson and so on. Uh, and then in the then where there's a lunch and then the afternoons we have a practical session. So they last two hours each and then the students are split up into groups and we just rotate through the, uh, the session. So each student go, experiences all six sessions and they just rotate through through the week. Uh, and you might uh, recognize some people here that have come through the years to give uh, to give the uh, lectures. And then here's just some pictures of the students working in the labs, uh, doing various things. So weighing out powders, uh, running the arc furnace, um, hydro learning what, what it takes to put together a hydrothermal uh, bomb, as they call it, um, and so on. So the, the students are quite enthusiastic about this approach. And over the several years, we've gotten very good reviews of, uh, of the way we've been doing things. And we, basically haven't changed the recipe too much because it works quite well and we plan to continue doing this. Um, oh yeah, okay. And then uh, at least for the last several years, we've, we've always tacked on a one day workshop to the end of this where uh, we, we focus it on some particular topic and we actually uh, bring in, you know, speakers relevant to the topic. So it's a full on workshop. Uh, you know, at, at, at uh, high level research talks and so on, but the students participate. So we, all the students that are in school sit in this, um, sit in this workshop and participate and listen to the lectures and so on. So it's worked quite well in the last couple of years we focused, you know, 2019 we focused on ceramic hexaboride, last year we focused, sorry, that's blocked, but we focused on uranium telluride. <laughs> And next year, I'm not sure, we of course, probably won't have the school, but uh, it'll be another focus topic that we'll, we'll pick. Okay, so basically that's it. Uh, I just want to thank uh, uh, various collaborators. This is just, you know, some of the collaborators involved in uh, UT2 research. Uh, and then a number of my group members, students and postdocs. And in particular, I, we've relied on the local students and postdocs to run the practical aspects of the winter school. So that's really been helpful to have a, uh, a key group of people that are experienced and also good at teaching students to do things. So we have some serious, uh, some senior scientists that have been with us for several years that have taken on this uh, responsibility. And as people come and go, of course, this is a bit of a challenge to have the right people in place to do these, these uh, training modules, but that's how it goes. So that's, you know, so it's worked quite well and we hope to continue to work on that in the future. So that's all I got and I'm happy to take some questions. Okay, thank you very much. That was, that was uh, a, a great talk and mixed a little bit of information about the training and about the science. So, uh, Let's open it up now for questions amongst the uh, participants uh, uh, for JP. Lou Lee's got a question there. Hey, JP, very nice talk. So my question is following, you started by showing the funding supports coming from NSF, DOE and the Quantum Initiative. It just feels, looks to me that the quantum defining quantum initiative, QLS, is very different from the quantum we typically talk about. If you look at the quantum leap centers they announced this week, uh, it, it's very, very different. Yes, and that's what I said. Uh, you know, my, my hope at least is that uh, quantum materials will, uh, will come along for the ride on this quantum bandwagon. <laughs> I mean, you know, we, we certainly have been fighting to s somehow uh, be a part of it. And there's, there's been levels of support that ranged from, like, for instance, the uh, some NSF and DOE programs that have given more emphasis on fundamental research. Now these quantum leap centers are, I, I mean, they're more directly focused on, on developing quantum technology. So th this is a bit of a challenge, right? I, I mean, we found ourselves trying to 
uh, essentially wear multiple hats, you know, so go from a talk like this where I talk about we're growing crystals, we're doing very basic research, uh, to pitching ideas about how to make devices, uh, you know, which is or is not within our, you know, our tool, tool chest to do things. And, and I think this is some of the flexibility that's required to try to, to be included in, in some of this momentum of quantum. And I, I don't know where, where it's going to go. I don't know if we're going to be able to do that or not. Um, I certainly at Maryland, we have not been successful in, uh, in gaining funding from any of these big centers so far. Other questions? JP, I was fascinated by the structure you were showing. Uh, was it yttrium aluminum four? Uh, um, barium aluminum four. Barium aluminum four. You had a question about that. That's, that seems to be a, a, a wonderful structure for many different materials. It's the yes. same thing that you see, if I'm not mistaken, in serum copper two, silicon two, uranium exactly. two, silicon two. And so it must be, there must be something about it that's more than just topology that makes it such a successful structure. Oh yeah, well it's, uh, yeah. I mean, I, I actually I didn't include, but there's a hierarchy chart of, I don't know, 20 or 30 different symmetry crystal systems that derive from this structure. Mm -hmm. And you know, like for even this one here is, this is non-central symmetric, right? So you mm -hmm. take, you know, you take, you arrange these in different ways, you add different uh, flavors of atoms and, yeah, I mean, that's the hope, I think, that uh, uh, we can take this and run with it in terms of trying to extend uh, what might be key aspects of the topology here into these other systems. Now, it's not clear how to do that exactly, of course, because some, you know, I'm not saying, for instance, that the, the non-trivial topology in barium aluminum 4 is a generic thing that's tied to the structure, mm -hmm. the, the elements matter, right? But uh, but barium and aluminum are very plain vanilla elements, right? There's nothing, you know, there's nothing very, very exotic about them. So that's what's interesting. If you can think about how to extend this structure, do substitutions and so on and, and play with this topology or bring in other ground states. So mm -hmm. in this system, for instance, um, right now we're studying strontium aluminum four, which has a charge order and a structural transition. And so charge order, you know, and presumably we haven't studied the electronic structure so much yet, but presumably it's not that far off from this. Mm -hmm. Now you're bringing in some charge order and perhaps there's also a magnetic order that you can bring in with a rare earth. So you can, um, you can look at this interplay. So that's what we're kind of excited about. Yeah, very interesting. I see there's a question from Vidya there. Vidya, please ask your question. Yeah, sorry, it's a question and a comment. Um, I, this is just going back to the funding situation. Okay. I, I know from NSF and DOE that they haven't received any additional funds for any of the quantum in initiatives. So right. this means that money is coming out of other programs and it's really hard for a, you know, a quantum materials person to actually get their hands on any of this funding. I'm just saying it's really hard. So. So it's a mixed blessing. There's a lot of focus on quantum, but, but there is a problem for people in our field doing hardcore correlated electron systems. Uh, so I don't know if you have any comments on this. Yeah, I agree completely. I mean, I, as I said, we have not been successful in trying to capture some of this funding. Um, I'm more familiar with, for instance, uh, what's going on at NIST because uh, you know, the, the National Quantum Initiative includes NSF, DOE, and NIST. And so NIST is a big chunk of that. And I know that, for instance, at NIST, uh, the, internal, um, uh, the internal groups there have been angling to try to, you know, take advantage of this as well. So there's not, not only from our perspective, but even from these institutions, there's been a lot of uh, maneuvering to try to, uh, you know, capture some money that isn't necessarily new money. Yeah, that's the hard thing. Um, I, I also talking to a few program managers of, from various agencies like Air Force and so on. 
I do know that also people are optimistic that uh, given the current stimulus money with COVID and so on, there may, you know, they're hoping that there will be an injection of money into science. So, you know, it's known there, there's research that shows that, you know, funding basic science is, is a way to drive the economy. That's proven. And so I think, uh, I mean, certainly people are hopeful that at some point there'll be some stimulus money that will go into basic research. I'm not sure it'll happen under this administration or not, but uh, it's, it's an obvious thing that could be done. So if that happens, then maybe there will be new money that goes into this or something else. I don't know. Hmm. Do you think that we need a bit more um, outreach from our field uh, to explain the excitement of what quantum material, materials are? Um, what do you think about that, JP? I saw you've written, you've written a book, uh, you're writing a book at least. Yeah, uh, yeah. Um, but I wonder whether we don't need more outreach at the, at the at really at the very elementary level. That, that doesn't hurt as usual, but I think uh, what, We've had a few workshops, you know, actually trying to address this question of how to engage this mm -hmm. quantum technology or quantum information community. Mm -hmm. And one of the key things that comes up time and time again is this question of quantum materials or materials for quantum, <laughs> you know? And just as an example, right, uh, some of the stuff I showed here uh, topological superconductors, for instance, has some promise of, of uh, having Majorana fermions that you can manipulate to do quantum computation. Well, from the other extreme, people uh, are working on silicon or some other very basic material to do to make qubits, and they want to improve the materials. Mm -hmm. You know, that's what I mean by materials for quantum. Mm -hmm. So th there's a disconnect between these two ends, right? And the way I look at it is there's, you know, quantum materials is a very fundamentally driven field, uh, exploratory and trying to develop basic uh, systems and approaches to, to next generation or next next generation technology. And materials for quantum is just, you know, bang the hammer and try to make silicon more pure or whatever the case is mm -hmm. to actually uh, achieve the goals of, you know, what they're trying to do currently. And we have to meet somewhere in the middle. I think that's the challenge. Mm -hmm. That's what has to be reflected in, in trying to go after some of this funding and so on. Mm -hmm. That's not an easy question. Okay, do we have any? Oh, yes, John Miller uh, has a question here. <clears throat> okay, uh, so the question has to do with um, I was actually uh, very uh, intrigued yesterday uh, about Phil Anderson, how he follows the data. You actually go, when it used to go into the lab and look at raw data. And I was wondering if your center, if you actually make some effort to try to bridge, bridge that gap between theory and experiments, you know, where maybe young theorists get exposed to uh, some experiment, I mean, yeah, yeah to uh -huh. data to some extent and vice versa. Yeah, that's a good question. So in terms of uh, research, that really depends on the theorist, <laughs> uh, and you know, you know, PI or student or postdoc or whatever. I mean, there, you know, on occasion there are people that do want to get involved in some sense, um, but that uh, that I'd say that's more rare. It, it, it more rare than than the usual case, but uh, I will say that in our um, in our, our fundamentals of quantum materials school. Uh, we, we were actually surprised early on to when, we, so we send out a solicitation and we get uh, applications from people all over the world, but mostly in the US to apply to the school and attend the school. And we we're quite surprised and delighted to get uh, theory applications. And every year we do get a number of theory students or postdocs that want to attend. And we have at least one or two or three such people attending and, and participating. And I think that's amazing, you know, to have some a, a theory grad student or postdoc that comes and actually sees how you're mixing the materials together and how they, how they come out. And they have some feeling, you know, it's like doing undergraduate labs. You, you touch the wires and you have some feeling for 
how things work. And I think that goes a long way. So, you know, we can't have an infinite number of people, so there's a limited capacity. But in principle, we could one year try to, you know, encourage to have a majority of theory people or have a theory based, you know, hands on training. That would be interesting. But yeah, we do see that a little bit, and it's, it's, it's quite nice to see. Teach them how to follow the data. Yeah. Well, I remember hearing a few years ago, Piers, that you were going to buy a quantum design instrument and do some. Oh, we did. We, I, we did. I actually got some money from Machine as part of startup. Anyway, that's another story. Uh, so I you, see, you're. So so Sang Sang got the machine in the end, and he never let okay. me. Get it. Yeah. <laughs> anyway. Um, okay, John Miller's. I couldn't. Uh, oh, Henri had a question. Yes. Ah, okay, I can speak. Uh, in fact, for this problem of uh, teaching, uh, I think in the undergraduate situation, one can play a lot with materials with this kind of things. I, I have, I have a transparency. If if you can give me the hand, I could show it, but sure. I don't know this, we, whether I can find it. Yeah, this one. Can you see it? Can you? Uh, Not yet. So what should I do to put it? Yeah, it's green, here? like you did before, remember? Yeah, the green. The green. Yeah, this one, which I like very much, uh, which I have in my lecture notes. Can you see it now? Not yet, no, not yet. Yes, now we can. Yes, good. Okay. Uh, the, the, this is the, this idea of using material science to learn about science is really uh, very nice. What I show here is really something I have been uh, monitoring in labs. Uh, in in the, in my teaching at Ecole Polytechnique, I was uh, I, I pushed a lot to get um, to get the training. Uh, experimental training uh, uh, at an important level and we had sessions which were which lasted something like 10, 10 afternoons on a given topic for uh, each student and these pictures which I put in my lecture notes are real this is the way things were happening these students were discovering levitation on materials that they had pressed themselves, cooked themselves. And the, it was very interesting to see how they reacted and how they understood what was science. And this is undergraduate students. So I think at this level, uh, one can play uh, and uh, uh, one can do quite a lot to popularize science and to give, to, to give the right feeling about what is science because Usually, when in the undergraduate, they have learned uh, mathematics rather than physics, at least in France. I don't know whether this is the case everywhere. But from what I hear, uh, having, uh, having people going to labs is something which is not that easy to start. And the, the big chance of condensed matter is that, that we can do that. You cannot do that with stars, with uh, astronomy or well, you, you are looking at fixed situations. Here you can be an actor. So uh, I think this is an interesting way. Uh, and uh, I, I encourage people to use my, my lecture notes, not because I'm going to make money with, with it. Uh, I, I, I am absolutely no interest. I, I don't gain anything. But I think the spirit in which the lectures are done are turned towards observation that, that uh, observation of data so they are i think it's a good complement to theoretical courses and uh, and it's still uh, the, the basic really the, the first first year course on uh, condensed matter i would say so in that sense i i like the the approaches done uh, in this quantum material project uh, what I am afraid of is that it is too short to get for a week. I, I would push uh, th these kind of things if they can last a little bit more. Uh, two weeks, 
even a month eventually with a big pro with a real project to 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 be handled uh, not g turning on machines but having an idea and going through it and doing the measurements and and if needed going to the to the uh, if you have ma many machines be being able to do different things you you could push the students to or the participants or uh, even researcher who would go as a postdoc there to go through a problem okay this is but i don't know whether you have ever, ever confronted this kind of situation well good thank thank you Henri, uh, for that uh, additional information i think it's always fascinating what you learn by just clear simple experimenting well i think if we're, we're, we're we're coming towards the end of day two of our ICAM Global Summit. And uh, I think we should end by thanking JP for his great talk. Uh, if you can unmute your, your mics and uh, uh, let's thank him, give him a round of applause. Yeah. Thank you. And uh, so we're closing for today, but we will meet again tomorrow. Uh, at 10.30 a.m. Uh, Eastern Daylight Time is the uh, Science Steering Committee of ICAM. And then uh, at 12.15, uh, we will return with a, another science lecture. In fact, Vidya, who's been here, will give the, tomorrow's first lecture. And then later, uh, going forward to 1.30 Eastern Daylight, Eastern Daylight Time, we'll have um, Bill Bialek uh, talking about criticality in biology from molecules to brain. So look forward to seeing you all tomorrow and thank you for coming today. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Thanks. Thank you. Bye. Stop the recording. Kanka, that went very well. He's gone. Yeah, it went quite, quite well. Yeah. And JP's uh, lecture was great. It was very nice. Fantastic. Very important. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, Sam, thanks for the help you gave us. Oh, yeah, no problem. <laughs> Not a problem which I didn't catch. Good. We're all becoming Zoom professors. <laughs> I thought the age index discussion went reasonably well. Um, it turned a little bit into a uh, 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 talking to the editors a little bit too much, I thought. Well, I think some people, Henri and uh, Eva and Laura, I think did make the point that scientists are the ones responsible. It's not really so much about the editors. Yeah. yeah. That, that, was, that was my, my uh, yeah. I thought that we, we sh having the editors would polarize the attention. And that's, that's what ha has happened. We should have done without them. <laughs> <laughs> we live as them. <laughs> no, but I think, I think one of the interesting questions coming out of that is, uh, can we make some recommendations that we post or we share with our community? We write things down. Because like, I think we, we covered a lot of interesting ground in that discussion. And uh, yeah. The, so, Pierce, I mean, one issue that uh, I guess, uh, uh, Gianfranco brought up, I'm not sure there was not further discussed is this uh, huge growth in publications and scientists. So True. is, they, is, they that, is that desirable or not? To me, it, uh, well, that was one of the first things that, uh, that struck me about his presentation is that the first thing you could say is, well, doesn't that mean there's too many scientists? Is yeah. that what he, that's what he was saying, but is that right, good or bad? No, I, I think it's not, it's not scientists. Uh, I think we are mixing, in his, in his count, he's mixing uh, what would be considered as engineering with, with what we call as science. That is, we are mixing a short term research and long-term research. Yeah, you, that might be true. It would be very interesting to get the breakdown. This is, we have to break down this. Yeah. This, 
but of course, it's very interesting that there is some bridge in between. This is very important. For instance, I know that in France, for instance, the, there is no bridge between these two. So we wouldn't count as scientists in France ma many of the people who are counted as scientists in the uh, uh, But But this is a, a bad point. I think we should have a situation in which we have more exchanges between the two communities. And, uh, but uh, counting uh, as uh, science publications, things which are not, I, I think he, he, uh, uh, there is a, a little bit uh, um, an exaggeration in, in counting all, all, uh, all these things. Mm -hmm. And also you have a lot of, of publications which are, which are wrong, no, of no interest at all for anybody. Mm. This is a different matter. But I, I guess the question, I mean, is it desirable or not to have a lot of people to some extent trying to use the scientific method to advance knowledge? I mean, maybe the general population, not just uh, those who are very, very creative, really. No, I, I think really the general population is very, the education in science is very low in the general education. And the, and the COVID situation has shown us that very, very nicely because people were absolutely unable to, to, uh, to think and to evaluate things. The, 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 when, uh, for instance, there, there has been a poll in, in France about chlorokine. And the, 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 the poll was, would you take it? Would you take it? <laughs> And only 20% said we don't know because we don't understand. So it's very strange. It means that science now enter the field of uh, polls. Uh, but Henri, you, you're, ta you're talking about the entire population, but say Gianfranco is talking about one out of 200. That's still a very special group. No, I it's, mean, they are at least trying to use the scientific method to produce knowledge, whether it's uh, actually adding a lot or not, I don't know. But is that desirable or not? I mean, do we really want to reduce the number of people? I mean, including, you, including those who are doing more engineering work. I'm taking that as science too. I mean, if they're... But yeah, I think it does, it does very much depend on what field they're in. So, for example, in people developing vaccines, having a lab of a thousand people working on it, you can actually work a thousand times faster than one person mm -hmm. testing all these different things that you need to test. Whereas in physics, it's not clear that a thousand people working on the same problem will be any better than one good person. It's so yeah, it depends on the field. It does depend on the field. So I was a bit, yeah, I wish he had managed to answer um, of this explosion, how many of them are actually in condensed matter physics, yeah. for example. So, yeah, of course it's increasing, but is it increasing slower than all the others? So the naive, I mean, I think the naive interpretation of it could be very negative for science. That yes, you know, that, that's, that's what struck me too, funding. yeah. We don't need any yeah. more funding. Maybe yeah. you should thin down for a couple of decades until you're back to 200 physicists in the world. <laughs> 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 yeah, but science is such a big area, as Henri says, like science yeah, engineering. But anyway, and I'm, I'm glad we had the dialogue. It was the first oh, step. Oh, yes. um, and I will try to get these things uploaded to YouTube. Um, haven't yet figured out which account to send them to, but we'll get them up there. Um, but they're already on YouTube. So if somebody clicks on that, they get the previous days. Well. What I want to do is to put individual links to each talk on the website, yeah, right. we'll, we'll do yeah. that. We haven't got there yet though, yeah. yeah it's cool. Okay, well I think it's great and see you tomorrow everyone. Have a good evening, good okay. afternoon. Thank you, right. see you. Whatever it is, good night. Uh, uh, good thank night. you everyone, I'm gonna turn off the uh, meeting now. Thank you, bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.